Second Kings, the seventh chapter, remain standing. Let's read together. Okay, uh, I don't want to read all of this, but so we'll jump around. Let's start off at verse 1, and I'll tell you where to go from there. Keep. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Come, let's read together. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine barley be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Verse 2, Then a Lord, on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. Come on, verse 3. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate, and they said to one another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore come, and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. Let's stop right there. You may be seated. The scripture text we read here today, there's a prophetic word that had just been released by the prophet Elisha. When you study the scripture, it kind of almost seemed like a random word. Doesn't look like it's specifically connected with the chapter before. We have this incident here in chapter uh, 7 of 2 Kings, and then it moves on to totally something different in chapter 8. But there's like an interruption by this prophetic word from the prophet Elisha, who now is the one operating in that prophetic gift, both for Israel and for Syria. And he has Elijah's double portion anointing. And he releases this word, says, tomorrow, about this time, that a measure of fine flour is going to be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gates of Samaria. And I so often say that doesn't mean much to us, but you, you imagine, he says, tomorrow gas is going to be 10 cents a gallon. And tomorrow, every house that's in the Midlands We'll sell, we'll sell for a maximum of $10,000 and a minimum of $5,000. All of a sudden, everybody can come to home, home on this. And this prophetic word basically is telling them something that was out of reach is going to be within reach. Things that you thought were impossible are going to be made possible for you. This prophetic word came and said, God is changing your economic situation. That things you thought you could not do, you're going to be able to do. Places you thought you could not go, you're going to be able to go. Things you thought you could not have, you're going to have. And folks got excited about it, except for this Lord on whose hand the king leaned. And, 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 and when he studied that in, in, in context, he said it, it literally means that this was a man who went around holding up the king because the king had some type, of, some type of ailment that he couldn't walk. It wasn't just somebody who leaned on him fig figuratively. He leaned on him physically. And he was cynical. He was cynical and said, yeah, right. C cynical is the second cousin of sarcasm. They're usually both expressed in the same way. Sometimes someone's cynical, can they, they, they're angry because of life circumstances, and they refuse to believe anymore. Been there, done that, tried that, got the T-shirt, the cup, the mug, the, 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 the uh, refrigerator magnet. I got the pen. I got all of that. Don't tell me that. I'm not going down that road anymore. I've tried that before. And they become cynical. And he becomes so cynical, he actually 
contradicts what God promises. He said, if the Lord will open windows of heaven, might this thing be? There's no way that could happen. But we know that God specializes, especially for the tither, of opening windows of heaven and pouring us out a blessing that we don't have room enough to receive. Oh, I'm declaring over somebody's life, God, get ready to open up a window. Other folks think it can't happen, but when windows happen, open, fresh air comes. When, fruit, when windows open, uh, uh, light comes. When windows open, witty inventions. When, win when windows open, what needs to go out goes out, and what needs to come in can come in. I'm declaring and prophesying that tomorrow about this time, God's changing somebody's economic situation around. So now the man of God says, well, let me tell you something, Mr. Cynic, Mr. Cynic, Mr. Sarcastic Brother. It's going to happen. You're going to see it with your eyes, but you won't be eating any of it. You won't see everybody getting in the house except you. You're going to see everybody filling their tank, and you can't even, but because it's going to be lines, and by the time you get to the line, ain't going to be no gas. You're going to see everybody else walking in the promises, but your cynicism and doubting the supernatural power of El Shaddai is shutting you off from the promises. That's why you won't tithe. That's why you won't be faithful. Because you become cynical. Been there, done that. A lot of people want overnight success, and, but you need to understand, principles work with consistency. A lot of people... Come on. You don't, you don't start off in kindergarten and then wonder why you don't have a degree. Come on. You, it, it, there's going to be some progression in this thing. But you got to know you're getting closer. Come on. Test by test. Grade by grade. Year by year. I'm, I'm, sometimes I get concerned about some of these accelerated programs. Come on now. Get your four-year degree in six months. How you going to cram all that knowledge? Look at your neighbor say, some stuff can't be crammed. I was a crammer, so I know. I was a crammer, I was just, and I said, well, I think they kept talking about this in class, so maybe they're going to talk about this. And then some of that stuff, I'm like, I hope they don't have, oh, I didn't cram that part. Come on, you cram, you're not going to know everything you need to know. And so some of us, we become cynical, and that's why we don't experience the supernatural power of God. But then the Bible goes on to say, it throws this in here in Verse 3, I've read this for years, and I had to really go spend some time with this when I lost the deal with me about this. I had to go, you know, some of you heard me preach on this and teach on this or refer to it in some type of way. But when you go to verse 3, it said, and, and there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate of Samaria. And they said one to another, why sit we here until we die? Now, the word of the Lord, let's look at it. 2 Kings 7 and 1. The word of the Lord, verse 1 said, he says, flour is going to be sold for a shekel, two barley of barley for a shekel, in the gate of Samaria. Where's it going to be? In the gate, which means it's going to be in the city of Samaria. Verse 3 said, but there were four leprous men at the entering of the gate. They weren't in the gate, they were at the gate. This is what the Lord showed me. Some of y'all, you, you at the church, but you're not in the church. And the reason why you're not really experiencing the supernatural power of God, because you at the church. You're not in the church. Some things only happen when you get in it. Somebody said to win it, got to get in it. I've been meaning to say this for a while now anyway. See, some of y'all, you were never in praise and worship. You at praise and worship. I've been, I've been, I, I've been wanting to, because, you know, so, sometimes service is high and people running around. Hey, glory. Hey, hey, and they're running and they get here, then a crowd coming in. And you start slowing down the traffic. Because you in the lane, 
because you wasn't in praise and worship, but you're trying to come at praise and worship. Some things only happen when you get in it. Can I tell y'all, praise is something you got to get in. Can't simply be at the praise service. <laughs> you got to be in the praise. You can't barely be at the worship service. You got to be in the worship service. And a lot of folks are at it, but they're not in it. But look what they said. They said, if we, why sit we here till we die? If we say we will enter into the city, the famine's in the city, we're going to die there, okay? And, and we shall die there. Uh, and if we sit here, we're going to die also. Now, let us fall unto the host of Syria. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, oh, we won't die anyway. This is what these lepers made a decision about. This is what they said in essence. And this is my subject. Nothing to lose. Look, somebody say nothing to lose. Nothing to lose. Look at your name and say, you have nothing to lose. Some of y'all, you just won't get in on the promises. But you have nothing to lose. Now, I'm going to say some stuff. Some of y'all won't get mad. And only ones that apply to won't get mad. You already broke. <laughs> what you got to lose by working the principles? If you give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. The devil's already eaten your lunch, your breakfast, your dinner, and your snack. What you got to lose by trying God when he said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. He not, shall not destroy the fruit. Of your ground, neither shall your vine cast its time before its fruit before the time in the season. These lepers weren't there when Elisha released and spoke this prophetic word, but but they were starting to sense a shifting and a troubling of the water. The reason why the lepers would be at the gate and not in the gate because the rule says lepers got to be ostracized outside the city. Got to be quarantined off by the law and just by societal norms. They have to be separated so they are at the gate. I'm, people tell me it's, it's changed now and But when I, we first went to Nigeria, it was a very traumatic experience. Just at the airport. Someone said it's changed now. I don't know. I don't have to see. But as soon as you walk outside the airport, they're all type of main, they were all, the first time we went through was 2002. They're all types of maimed people, missing limbs, face deformity. Burns all over their face. People missing limbs. Half bodies. And they were all around the airport. And so just as you're coming out, they immediately start begging. And it overwhelms you to see all this at one time in one place. So the lepers are outside the city, potentially begging, hoping somebody might throw them some food. Remember? When the lepers, when Jesus was coming through a coast, I think it was Thyatira, that Jesus coming through and the lepers cried out from afar, Jesus have mercy on us. And he yells, I'll come back to that in a moment. He yells at them, go show yourself to the priests. They weren't close. He didn't touch them, but they yelled out to him. These lepers are at the gate. They were... Poverty stricken. They were dying from hunger. But they asked themselves a question. Why are we going to go out like this? 
Why sit we here until we die? Things aren't going good. And if we just let things progress without any type of effort on our part, we already know how this is going to end. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. It's not a matter of if we die of hunger, it's a matter of how soon we die from hunger. You got to look at your life and realize when this ain't going good. You got to look at your life and realize when your human effort is not working. You got to look at your life and say, I got a degree. I tried this. I'm smart. I'm educated. And still I ain't prospering. I got connections. I got looks. I got nice stuff. I look good on the outside, but I know inside something's missing. At some point, you got to be honest up with yourself and get a vision for the life God wants you to have versus the one that you've created. And come to the conclusion, I really got nothing to lose by getting all in. Come on, ask two or three people around and say, are you all in? Are you all in? Are you all in? These lepers sitting outside the city, not allowed to go in, restricted from the prosperity of the city, ostracized from the social activity of the city, because poverty has a way of ostracizing you and restricting you from a good life that others are enjoying. The private school that a couple of my children graduated from every year, and, and I mean, how, how long have my kids been out of high school? Six to ten years or something like that. So it's been a long time since we had gone. But they do an annual auction every year. First time we went, it was down at the fairgrounds, and it's probably been eight to ten years since we went. And so I, I kept getting the invitation to go. I said, oh, Pastor, I said, I want to go. So we, 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 we went last night. And it amazes me the money that people have to just spend on stuff. Okay. Somebody paid up to $7,000 just to get the front row seat at the graduation for their child's graduation. Yeah. The bidding started at $2,000. Can I get three, 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 two? One guy, he was standing there. I said, he must be drunk. <laughs> I want to tell him, do, I want to say, do you know what this is you bidding on? I think the bird's eye view at the graduation, because I, we know they, they have the graduation. They have it at First Presbyterian Church downtown. Pretty, it's a historic church, but very small church. And they got, you know, got seats on the pews, and they got seats on the balcony. And so, and so 6,000, 6, 7,000. I was willing to bid. My son and I, Tyler, we were willing to bid on a, on a, on a family trip. And so I said, I said, I need you to go in with me on this, and we get this one. And so we know, 2,000, 2,000, two, two and a half, two and a half, hands on, two and a half. So we, we figured we, we were going to go up to about 3,000. We got to 3,000, and then Tyler I said, what, what was that? <laughs> you know, I don't know if you've ever been to an auction. You, at some point, you get like this. <laughs> the man says, sir, sir, are you waving high? What is it? If you flinch, it's yours. <laughs> so the trip to the villa in Costa Rica went for about 8,000. You still got to fly there and all that. Okay. I looked at things that people get money to. And, just, and they were just buying things not because they need it, just to enjoy it. One, one of them went for just to be at the sidelines with the, with, and spend time on the sidelines with Coach Muschamp when they played Kentucky and Vanderbilt. That went for about $10,000. I think when you kind of spend that kind of money, drinking helps. <laughs> Maybe on Super C Sunday, I'll serve a little something, something up in here. <laughs> Lord, maybe, we get, maybe we finally get that million dollars. Yeah, Pastor! 100,000! <laughs> I 
because I had got a priest that we left, and I, they had a boat. They had a boat that was starting at 41000 I texted my son. I said, how much did the boat go for? He said, it went for about 55000 And every time I go to some of these affairs, luxurious kind of affairs, I realize the things that poverty keeps you outside of. Realize the things you're never exposed to or can even have brain space to think about because of poverty. There are people who live in New York City, less than a mile away from Broadway, who have never been to a Broadway play. Not just because, not just because they don't know about it, but because they don't have time to think about Broadway when you're trying to make a way. Poverty restricts you. It keeps you from enjoying life. That's why 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, Charge them who are rich in the world that be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. It is the will of God for you to, to enjoy life and not to keep living outside the city. Ah, glory. It's the will of God. For you to not just only be at prosperity, but in prosperity. Are y'all hearing me? It's the, it's the will of God for you not simply be at the wealthy place, but he wants you to live in the wealthy place. Because the thing about being at it is that you're close enough to see how other folks are living. You're close enough to see what they're enjoying, but you can't enjoy it yourself. And I believe that's what happened with that cynical man. He said, he said, you're going to see it. <laughs> he said, you're going to see it, but you will not eat thereof. You will see it, but you will not eat thereof. Poverty has a way of ostracizing. Sickness. It's, leprosy was a disease. It was sickness. Sickness and disease limit your activity. Restricts your mobility. And counters the enjoyment of life. And to operate in faith, you got to count up the cost. You got to count up the cost and make a decision, I got more to gain than to lose. Glory to God. You will never get saved until you realize I got more to gain than to lose. Come on now. Until you realize Jesus is more important than Bubba, come on, you won't, you won't, you won't get saved. Until you realize Jesus can take better care of you than living with somebody abusing you who helped you pay your rent. You'll stay in that situation. Oh, y'all don't like me this morning here. You got to count up the cost and say, I have more to gain than to lose. Come on, is that anybody's witness that when you got saved, I got more to gain than to lose? So to come to this conclusion, first of all, you got to evaluate your current situation. Those lepers said, why are we sitting here? They evaluated this situation and said, we are dying. Got to recognize when this ain't working. Got to recognize when stuff is not headed in the right direction. I really do believe the prodigal son of Luke 15, he stayed too long. Come on, come on. The, the Bible said he began to be in want. Come on, before he was in the pig pen, he began to be in want. But his pride said, I can't go back to my daddy. I'm going to prove I can make it out here. Some of y'all, I can prove you don't have to be saved to, to have a good life. I'm going I'm, to I'm, I'm prove that I don't need Jesus. I'm going to prove there's nothing to this Christianity. He stayed too long. I don't know one person who comes out of a real Christian family who was saved and saw that their parents were genuinely saved and had a relationship with the Lord, because of how they're living now, I don't know one of them who will say, who say, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm planning on staying a sinner all my life, and I'm going to go to hell. I ain't never heard nobody say that. They all say the same thing. I'm going to get myself together. One day, I'm going to get myself together. One day, I'm going to come home. One day I'm going to get in the church. One day I'm going to be serious with my walk with God. But many of them never make it because they stay too long. 
sometimes young ladies, usually young ladies more than men, but men can do it too. Samson did it. Marry somebody, get with somebody, because this is where you are right now. So you all meet in the club while you're getting high. But you know you ain't plan on staying high. You plan on sobering up at some point. Then you get sober, you're like, what the? How I end up here? Married this person in this relationship. This ain't even me. Come on now. But what happens is you make a permanent decision in a temporary situation. So people say stuff like, when I get myself together. And so, and so you, get with, you get with somebody simply because you got needs, your fleshly needs. And your flesh needs and your sexual needs, what you call a need, is really not needs, it's desires. Okay? okay? Your sexual desires are driving all your decisions or your emptiness in your heart for just wanting somebody to love me. Even if it's nobody, it's somebody. If he has nothing, she has nothing there, somebody, even if I, if I can't take him where I'm going, let me just forget about that and think about right now. I want somebody to love me. I want to say that I have somebody. So you make a permanent decision in a temporary situation. And then when you come to yourself, like the prodigal son and said, why am I in this relationship with this man who is a pig farmer? I've been raised not to even be around pigs. I don't eat pigs, unlike y'all. He didn't eat bacon. He eat ham. He down here. Now, now, now he getting ready to eat what the pigs were eating. Finally he said, how, how did I end up here? And he arose and went to his father. You got to evaluate your situation and realize when this isn't working. Trying to make it on your own, violating the principle of God, won't tithe, won't give, won't live holy. Come on, won't, won't walk in the principle of God. Is that working for you? My question, how's that working out? The Bible does not say, really, the way of a sinner is hard. That ain't what the Bible says. The Bible says the way of a transgressor is hard. A transgressor is someone who goes against what they know. And some of y'all, you wonder why, because the truth of the matter, there are sinners who are getting away with what you can't get away with. Okay, have, have, have anyone found that out? Because they, some of them are ignorant. You're not ignorant, you're rebellious. Ignorance and rebellion are two different things. The way of a transgressor is hard, not the ignorant. Paul said, I, I didn't deserve to be an apostle. I was injurious to the church. I persecuted the church. He said, but I did it ignorantly in unbelief, so God had mercy on me. And some of us, when, when you know the word, when you know what the word says, when you hear the word, when, when you've been raised with the word, when, you, when you, uh, uh, re, the word is constantly being reinforced to you, but you don't do it, it's going to be hard. Because to whom much is given, much is required. Jesus said, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not shall be beaten with many stripes. I know that because Mother Betty used to drive that home to me all the time. You're going to be beat with many stripes. You're going to be beat with many stripes. You're going to be beat with many stripes. Because he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not shall be beat with many stripes. Secondly, you got to contemplate the opportunity. Why sit we here till we die? We sit right here, we definitely going to die. If we go forward, we might die, but we might live. You got to hypothesize. When I was in grad school, I could handle it now because I'm at a whole different place now and I got more experience with money and managing corporations and all that kind of stuff. But I went to grad school right after college and I was in love, working as a social worker for my 40 plus hours a week. Then I was running what called special response unit, SPRU, 
where they call you any time in the middle of the night and got to drive to another county because I lived in one county and had to work in another county to pick up a child in the middle of the night who was being abused out on the streets or whatever. And I was just burnt out. And so one of the classes I was taking, I just couldn't wrap my brain around, was a class called Cost Benefit, cost benefit Analysis. Then stuff really got messed up because when I went to withdraw from that class and keep another class, they mixed it all up. And so they kept me in that class and withdrew me out of the class that I was doing well in. But that's why I was first introduced to this whole concept about cost-benefit analysis or, call, or CBA. It's sometimes called the benefit-cost analysis or BCA. It's a systematic approach to estimating the strengths and the weaknesses of alternatives. Before you make decisions, you got to contemplate the opportunity and do a cost-benefit analysis. For example, in transactions and activities and functional business requirements, it's used to determine options which provide the best approach in achieving benefits. In other words, you got to look over your life and say, where am I going? And is this going to get me there? Is this going to take me closer to my goal or or, or take me further away from my goal? Is this going to cause me to be in purpose or is it going to cause me to get out of purpose? Is, is this going to cause me to be in the will of God or is it going to cause me to be out the will of God? Everybody say long term. My wife can always tell you, I've always been a person who thinks long term. I'm all, I've always been a person who thinks long term. Glory to God. The reason why I've been able to be faithful to my wife without, without ever being with another woman in the last 30 years because I think long term. Let me hold you tight. If only for one night. No, no, one night ain't going to be worth my life. No, sir. One night ain't going to come on. When you're really excited, it ain't going to last no night. It's going to be about five. Anyway. Any, uh, <laughs> tell me that night. When you're full of lust, it ain't no night. One embarrassed, the other one mad. That's for the adults. Look at your neighbor. That's for the adults. I'm sorry. You sure are. And I've always been able to think long term. Yeah, that might be good for a moment. But it ain't worth it Have my children disrespect me. Come on. It's not worth it for all of a sudden the press to be following me and talking about me. It's not worth it for me to give your family and your family members and your old pastors and 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 the and and your and your, your my haters ammunition to tell you then you went over there. That's your pastor, huh? See, it's not, see I, I think through all of that stuff. Come on, it's not because I'm just so holy. I, I, God gave me a mind to think. So I always, I always teach my sons in ministry. I say, play it out. I know, I know it's a good idea, right? Play it out. Come on, play that whole thing out. You can't think for the moment. You got to play it out. Now, what happened when your wife finds out? What happened when the pastor finds out? What happened when the bishop finds out? What happened when your boss finds out? It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Look at your name and say, play it out, play it out. I told y'all when Pastor Marshall got pregnant with our third child, Daniel, it was a surprise. That's just like all the other ones. It was a surprise. <laughs> we didn't do no family planning. Our family planned us. Huh, time for you to be a parent. Okay. So she woke up in the middle of the night. I think she woke me up. I'm so glad she woke me up. And so we had Tyler. We had Chandler. We had Tyler. She woke me up. I remember the house that we were living on and the little house there in Maine. She said, uh, I was just going to leave, but I thought I'd tell you. She said, so I took the money out your wallet. And I'm driving back to New Jersey tonight. It's about 3 o'clock in the morning. She said, I, I, because you just going to keep me barefoot and pregnant. And I promise you, I didn't meet to her. It was me, us. It was us, too. Wasn't no me too, it was us too. This was cooperative economics. Because it takes two to make a thing all right. <laughs> and she said, you're just going to keep me barefoot and pregnant. And I just can't. And she, she just found out she's pregnant with Daniel. And she's overwhelmed. She starts crying. 
And I, oh, no, 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 no. I think she was going to take Tyler. Huh? I, no, I, I think she would. Well, anyway, because this is what I remember. I remember saying, I said, okay. I said, what you want me? I remember saying, what you want me to tell Chandler? When he wake up in the morning, you ain't here. I said, what you want me to tell him? I remember telling her. I said, what, what you want me to tell him? She said, I don't. And then Daisy, I don't. I don't care about baby. And I told her, I said, baby, it's going to be all right. It ain't going to be this way always. Now, I could have said, now, you ain't going nowhere. Now, first of all, Pastor Marcia, she can't go in the door at the mall and, and come back out the same door. She is directionally challenged. We went to this event last night. They gave us name tags, and I walked up to her, and her name tag was upside down. I said, honey, it's hard to read like that. You got to... She couldn't hardly drive around the corner and find a way home. And she's going to drive from Maine to New Jersey. And I, I didn't, I didn't tell, I just, I, no, I just tried to get a, just play it out. I said, so now, what you want me to say? And then when are you going to come back? Oh. And then the more I tried to ask a question to figure that, she'd be like, I ain't got this. I don't know what I'm going to do. What I tried to listen, I'm making a point here. I, 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 I could have I, I got angry and said, no, no. I wanted her to make her own decision. You got to think this thing out. I know you're caught up in your emotions right now. I know you're upset. I know you're feeling overwhelmed. But play this thing out. You can't afford to get caught up in your emotions when, when the will of God is at stake. Play it out. Look at your neighbor and say, play it out. Play it out. Think it out. Do some cost-benefit analysis here. Cost-benefit analysis has two main applications. First, to determine if an investment or decision is sound. Ascertaining if and by how much it benefits outweigh the cost. Is this, is, is this worth this? Secondly, cost-benefit analysis is to provide a basis for comparing investments or decisions. Comparing the total expected cost of each option with its total expected benefits. Is this worth this? Is it worth it to do this, to stay here, to not operate in the will of God, to do things my own way, to make my own decisions, to, 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 to try to plan my, is it worth it? Or is it better to do what God said? And throughout scripture, God has always been giving his people prosperity and investment opportunities. Job 36, 11, he said, if you obey me and serve him. You shall spend your days in prosperity and your years in pleasure. How much, how much want prosperous days and pleasurable years? He said, well, you got to obey and serve me. That's the way that happens. He says in Matthew, I quoted earlier, in Matthew 3 and 10, if we bring all the tithes into the storehouse, there can be, so it can be meat in his house. He said, prove me. He said, prove me. Put me on the line. He said, and I, I'll, if, if I won't open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive. He said, now do some cost-benefit analysis here. Luke 38, he gives us another opportunity for cost-benefit analysis. He says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will men give into my bosom. So he says, make the analysis. Is it worth you holding it or is it worth you giving it? I learned the principle years ago. If it's not enough for your need, make it your seed. Can't do nothing with this anyway. I told you when we started off in ministry, I knew how much money I needed, and the Lord told me to be full-time in ministry. I had brought everything down to bare minimum. I was making about sixty, sixty-five thousand dollars $65,000 a year with bonuses, not counting expense accounts and all that kind of stuff. And then I went down to nothing. And then when we talked to the board, the, the church was able to give us $150 a week. And I knew that I couldn't do enough. I needed at least $3,000 a month. That amounts to $600 a month. And I said, listen, I can't do nothing this, with this anyway. It wasn't enough for my needs, so I made a decision to make it my seed. I made a decision, okay, God, I, I can't do anything with this, so I need to put it in your hand so you can magnify it. 
I can't budget with this. I can't plan with this. I need something supernatural to happen in my life. So, God, I'm going to give it to you and do something with it. Come on. If you did it for the little boy with the loaves and the fish, you can do it my $150. If you did it with the woman who had a little bit of oil, you can do it for me. If you did it for the woman of Zarephath who had just a little bit, a little bit of meal, and now she ate many days, if I give it to you, God, I'm going to trust that I have nothing to lose by doing it your way. Oh, glory to God. And I'm here now. 20 plus years later saying God is faithful. I had nothing to lose. I, I don't regret one decision. God showed himself strong. Because know what I did? I switched systems. Every Christian, if you're going to walk in the supernatural, you got to make a decision to switch systems. You either walk by faith or you walk by sight. You do it God's way or you do it man's way. You're either spiritual or you're carnal. So I made a decision to switch systems. The man at the pool of Bethesda, Jesus asked the man a question. Will thou be made whole? Think about it. No, you got all your complaints, but do, do you really want to be made whole? That's the question you all got to ask when it comes to doing things your way, doing things God's way. Do you really want to be made whole? Now, different people have different risk factors, risk analysis. Some people conservatives, some people intermediate, some people take very high risk. And some people are completely risk adverse. Ah, oh, they won't try anything. They won't try anything. But at some point, y'all, you got to realize, I got nothing to lose. Come on, what I've been doing, and I've been doing all this time, I've been trying to make my way prosperous uh, other than through meditating on the word day and night, and it's not working. I've got nothing to lose. These lepers made a decision to choose the possible over the inevitable. I'm going to encourage you and challenge some of you today to make a decision to choose the possible over the inevitable. The, the inevitable is definitely what's going to happen. The possible is what God can do. The inevitable is where this is definitely going to end up. The possible is what God can call, where God can cause you to end up. Matthew 19, 26, Jesus beheld them and he said, with men it's impossible, but with God all Things are possible. Say that with me. With God, all things are possible. Come on, say it again. With God, all things. Say it one more time. With God, all things are possible. So with God, I got to be with God. Come on, I've been trying to do it by myself, but I got to get with God. Because <laughs> if I get with God, all things are possible. With you, I don't know if that's going to work, but with God, it will definitely work. Because with God, all things are possible. The man who had the demon possessed, or depending on which translation you read, the lunatic son. Some people just try to take all the spiritual aspects out of it and just simply call him an epileptic son. In Mark 9, 22 and 23, he had brought him to Jesus. To his Jesus' disciples, they couldn't cast him out. And then he finally brought him, brought him to Jesus. I brought him to your disciples. They can't do nothing with the boy. And he says to Jesus, gives him the situation. Sometimes he throws himself to the fire. Then all the time he throws him, he throws him into the water to destroy him. And then he says this to Jesus. If thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus didn't hesitate in how he responded to him. Jesus said to him, if thou canst believe. All things are possible to him that believes. It's not a matter of whether I can do it. It's a matter of whether you believe I can do it. It's not whether I can make a way. It's whether you're going to trust me to make a way. It's not a matter of whether I can increase you. It's a, it's a matter of whether you will let me increase you. It's not a matter of whether my word works. It's a matter of will you work the word. God says, don't put this on me. It's on you. These lepers decided. To take a chance and believe God for the possible. Look, somebody say, take a chance. <laughs> Come on, what you doing ain't working. Come on, take a chance on God. I've been quoting it all month. Ecclesiastes 9-11 says, I returned and I saw under the sun the race into the swift. 
The battle's not to the strong, neither yet the bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding. And favor doesn't always happen to men of skill. But time and chance, time and chance happen to them all. When Jesus asked that man, could he be made whole, that was his opportunity, glory to God. He talked about all the other people that came by and other people got in the water before him, but this was his chance. At that point, he had to make a decision, Jesus, I want to be made whole, and if you are willing to do it, I'm willing to receive. God just wants somebody who's willing to receive. Oh, glory to God, let me start wrapping this up here. And then the third thing you're going you're gonna to have to do, if you are going to, if you, if you're going to realize you got nothing to lose, you got to motivate yourself. Motivate yourself to move from your current situation. I don't mean no harm, but all this crying ain't going to change your situation. All, all talking about how you was raised, it ain't going to change your situation. Talking about who abused you, it ain't going to change your situation. Talking about the education that you don't have, that ain't going to change your situation. Talking about you wish you had went back to school 20 years ago, that ain't going to change your situation. Talking about the economy and talking about the Democrat and talking about the Republican, it's not going to change your situation. You have to motivate yourself and say, I don't care why I'm here, I'm going to get up from here. I don't care who caused me to be here, I'm going to get up from here. I'm I'm not going to sit here and die in this situation. Ah, glory to God. So verse 5 says, and they rose up and went. They rose up and went. They rose up and went. Somebody got to make up your mind that you got to say to them, it's time for me to rise up and go. Glory to God. I've been sitting here long enough. I've been complaining long enough. Glory to God. Come on, some of y'all, you've been in this church too long to still be broke. You've been under this word of prosperity too long to not be prosperous. You've been under this word of increase too long to not be increasing. You don't have to be where everybody else is, but you ought to be able to look over your life and say, ever since I've been under this word, stuff been working. Things are getting better. I'm getting closer and closer to my wealthy place. Oh, glory to God. I'm walking in more authority than I ever walked before. I'm walking in more wisdom than I ever walked before. I got to get up from here. Oh, glory to God. Ah, oh, glory to God. They rose up and went. They rose up and went. Would you look at somebody and say, it's time to rise and go. <laughs> it's time to rise up and go. 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 Isaiah 61 says, arise and shine. For your light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen up on thee. I already had this in my notes, and Pastor Moss has said it on, on, on Friday night. You got to get off your do nothing and do something. Come on, don't get mad. Don't be scared. Look at your neighbor and say, get off your do nothing and do something. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I know you, were, you didn't have the best of circumstances. I know you're going through a divorce. Uh huh, uh huh. I, 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 know, I know you didn't have the best school system. Oh, I, I know you didn't have the best parents. And I, boy, I only had parents like, like, like the baddies had parents. And I only had this and like that. And if I only had a father who did this and I had a mother, who did, oh, come on. It's time to get off your do nothing and do something. You got to shake yourself. I dare somebody right now to shake yourself. Hallelujah. Isaiah 52 and says, shake yourself from the dust. Those lepers have been sitting there and they said, we're going to rise up. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise and sit down. Loose yourself. Loose yourself. Stop waiting for somebody to loose you and loose yourself. Make up in your mind. I'm getting out of this. I'm getting out of this. I'm getting out of this. They may not see you, but while they're not looking, I'm getting out of this. That's why I've got that little savings account, because I ain't planning on staying here. That's why I'm paying these bills off one at a time and little by little, because I'm getting out of this. That's why I'm not spending all my money anymore. And I'm not getting down to my dime anymore because I'm getting out of this. That's why I'm getting on that treadmill because I'm getting out of this. That's how I'm watching what I'm eating because I'm getting out of this. 
I saw my parents die with it. I saw my aunts die with it. Oh, glory to God. But I'm getting out of this. I'm getting out of this. Why sit here until I die? If God be for me, get like the prodigal son and say, I will arise. I will arise and go to my father. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Let me in here. You may have to wiggle yourself like the woman with this your blood who said, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. You may have to shout and cry like blind Bartimaeus. Hallelujah. And say, Master Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. I know I was born blind, but I believe I don't have to die blind. I heard that you're giving sight to the blind. Hallelujah. You have nothing to lose by obeying God's word. He said, is anything too hard for God? Listen, if you're already broke, if you're already in debt, if you're already discouraged, if you're already discontented, you have nothing to lose. That's why those men got on David's team. In 1 Samuel 22, it said everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, they gathered themselves together, and he became a captain over them. They said, we need a new leader now. Because where we are is not working. Glory to God. Naaman decided, I'm already a leper. And somebody said, man, what you got to lose? The man saying, just go, just dip. Humble yourself. Just dip in this Jordan. You'll be made whole. And the word of the Lord is some of y'all saying, you have to get off your high horse. You have to humble yourself and be willing to dip. Peter, go down to the fish's mouth. Open up the fish's mouth, throw in a hook. First fish he find, gonna have some money in it. Well, I ain't never, I ain't, I've been fishing all my, I ain't never found no fish. What you got to lose, Peter? You don't have no money to pay this. What you got to lose? By doing what I said. Abraham and Sarah, questions asked. God says, about this time you, you have a child. And Sarah laughed. You can read it any way you want. She said, shall I have pleasure? <laughs> In my old age, come on, Sarah, what you got to lose? Go at least try to have some pleasure. And you might have pleasure twice. You might have pleasure tonight, then have pleasure nine months from tonight. Look, somebody say, what you got to lose? Moses at the Red Sea. The word of the Lord comes, go forward. Come on, everyone stand. Go forward. Watch this. They had to make a decision. What we got to lose? We can't run up the mountains beside us. The army's behind us. If we stay here, they're going to come and kill us or take us back in slavery. So God tells them, go forward towards the Red Sea. What did they have to lose? Because we stay here, we're going to die. We're going to be in captivity. But as they went and obeyed God, the Red Sea opened up. I'm prophesying over somebody today. If you would just obey God, he's going to open up a Red Sea in your life. He's going to make a way out of no way. He's going to get you through a place you never thought you could get through. He's going to take you into a land you never saw yourself living in. And those priests, those lepers in the New Testament, Jesus tells them, they cry out to Jesus. Jesus gives them one simple word. Jesus didn't even tell them. He didn't even say, you're healed. You're whole. Your leprosy's gone. He said none of that. All he said was, go show yourself to the priests. 
They could have said, now that makes no sense. Because you can't go see the priest if you got leprosy. But the reason for going to see the priest is because before you enter, re-enter society, the priest had to say you were ceremonial clean. He had to declare. He had to give you papers. Yeah, they all right. So the rest of the people wouldn't be contaminated. And the Bible says, as they went. I'm talking to somebody. As you go, as they went, they were made whole. Now I got to thinking about this. Ten of them. But as he was going to be made whole, the rest of them, they got so excited about their harvest. They failed to praise the one who gave them the harvest. One of them ran back and said, Jesus, just want to tell you thank you. Just want to tell you thank you. Jesus, one, one there ten, how is it? There's only one. Can I tell you? If you're going to keep being made whole, and if you're going to maintain in your healing, wholeness, prosperity, keep giving them thanks. Don't forget where he brought you from. Don't forget what he's done for you. You got nothing to lose. 